Hi, today we've got the last video in this series of looking at hot air stations and this time we've got the Quick 861X. So the 861X is very similar to the very popular 861DW but this is the highest power model that they do in the 861 range. So this one is a 1300 watt heater capable of 200 litres per minute from the blower. There is the 861DE, which has a 1200 watt heater and 200 litres per minute. And then there's the well-known 861DW, which has a 1000 watt heater and an output of 120 litres per minute. So this one is priced highest out of all three. This one comes in at about $430 delivered. And as you know, the 861DW, somewhere around $300 delivered. There is a ripoff of the 861DW, which you'll find on AliExpress and eBay, that's coming in for about $200. I'm not sure what the quality of that one's like. Uh, I suspect they've made some cost-cutting measures, even though these are relatively budget stations in the first place. Uh, maybe at some point in the future we'll take a look at that one as well. So this one's relatively new to me. It's only just arrived. And the 861X obviously has this very nice black colour to it. It's very, very similar to the best BST863 in terms of its construction. From what I can see, it's only the front panel that is different here. And you can see you've got the up and down buttons for temperature control, up and down buttons for the airspeed, and then we've got three presets so that you can very easily access a few different settings that you've already preset onto those buttons. This one has a very similar hose length to the best BST863, about 60 centimetres or so, but it does have quite a different handle in comparison. If we have a look at that one, um, you can see this one's got the ridges and the little coloured collar. The one that's fitted to the best station, this one at the top, actually looks like the one that comes with the 861DW. This 861X does have a different handle, and I don't know if that's partly to do with the fact that this one it's sort of indicating that it's made from an ESD dissipative material rather than just plain plastic. So maybe that explains the differences. It's still quite comfortable to hold. There's no real complaints, really. It just doesn't have those ridges for you to sort of rest your fingers on. Both the best and the quick hot air stations have these swirly nozzles at the end here to try and give you a different kind of airflow. But they do have different nozzles. They are pretty much interchangeable. You can certainly fit the quick ones onto the best, but actually the fitting of the best um, nozzles onto the end of the best station is significantly better than it is on the quick. So the quick one just sort of slides on here, but you can see it's a little bit wobbly, not held on particularly well. If we take a look at the best station, it sort of slides in to this collar here. And then once it's in, it stays in a whole lot better. The fitting has definitely sort of got a little click once you put it in all the way. On the rear of the unit, there's not much going on again. Very similar to the other quick station, basically a hardwired mains lead. This one may well get changed because I think I'm going to use this as one of my main hot air stations. And we've got a little 4mm banana socket here for an earthing lead. And then we've got a fuse just at the top here. Just on the rating plate, we've got the input, 220 volt AC, 1.3 kilowatts, and the fuse is a 10 amp fuse. And we've got a relatively new model here, 11th of March 2020, which isn't that much before when I ordered it, but it did actually take quite a long time for it to arrive. So we'll just take a quick look at the operation of this thing. So let's turn it on. Single beep, and then we're presented with some dashes on the screen. Now what I did notice, quite nicely is that you can set the temperature and the airflow while the handpiece is still in the cradle, which is something that you can't always do on these stations. Um, it is one degree increments, which is a bugbear of mine, but the acceleration is fairly natural. So it's about one and a half seconds or so. So it's not too bad at all and the buttons are quite responsive. So you can go up and down really quite quickly. You can store them as presets as well while the handpiece is still in the cradle. And there we go, that's stored in setting one. If we actually take the handpiece out, it starts ramping up. And one thing that I'm seeing already, and I'm not sure if it's showing up on camera, the lab lights are flickering quite considerably. 
this is something that I haven't seen in any of the other stations, even the best, which has a very similar power heater. But we're seeing quite a lot of flicker going on. The lab lights in here are powered from the same socket, but I'm surprised that we're getting so much flicker on here. At full speed, it does get quite noisy. It is quite loud, but you'd expect that from something that's delivering so much air. It's not too offensive. In fact, uh, it's not too bad at all. You don't get the weird squeal that you get with the best station. It's a little bit slower to ramp up the pump and ramp it back down. And then when you put the handpiece back in the cradle, you can see it starts ramping up the airspeed to bring down the temperature. It's interesting that they've chosen to ramp it up and down so slowly. On the best hot air station, as soon as you put the handpiece in, it just ramps up straight to full speed and cools it down really, really quickly. I'm not really sure whether there are any mechanical advantages on these brushless fans. It's only really the bearing that's seeing any of the forces, and I wouldn't have thought it's too compromised by suddenly a high torque situation where you're trying to ramp up the speed rapidly. Right, so I've just put the thermocouple in the end of the handpiece, and at very low airflow rates, we're a little bit off on the temperature, so about 78 degrees as opposed to the 100 degree set point. Let's see if that changes with airflow. Not a huge amount, still a little bit off. Let's turn up the airflow some more. And again, still off to some degree. We can see the variance. It's changing by a couple of degrees, basically. Let's turn up the settings. So about 40 degrees off there at 300 degrees. Turn down the airflow a little bit and even further out at the slower air speeds. This one goes all the way up to 500 degrees C. The lab lights are flickering quite a lot, but this is starting to get way off now. We're nowhere near. Yeah, it gets a little bit closer, but it's still a long way out. So yeah, it's got to be said, it's not the most accurate. In fact, the uh, the little Metcal pencil was a little bit more accurate than this one is. It certainly can deliver temperature if you set it high enough. And again, like I always say, these are really just for indication, generally speaking. When you're actually doing your hot air soldering, you're still using your eyes to see what's going on and to see if you need a bit more heat. And we may do a future video just on what we're actually looking for during the reflow process so that we know what we actually want to set these to. So here's the inside of the unit. The mains cord comes in at the back, straight into a fuse and then off to the front panel. We've got the main power supply PCB. We'll have a closer look at that in a minute because I'm very surprised what we've got on here. And then finally, just take a look at this pump. This is the, you know, an absolute mother of a pump. No wonder it can deliver such high airflow rates. This is huge in comparison to any of them we've seen on the previous stations. We've then got the front panel PCB, which looks a little bit like the one from the best, but it's not quite the same. But uh, not too bad in construction. Definitely cheaper. Um, certainly nowhere near sort of the industrial quality of the Metcal station, but certainly not offensive or uh, that bad in any way. So here we've got the main PCB, and it's got the switch mode power supply for the whole device, and then also the driver for the motor in the pump. And unlike the best station, they've gone for a switch mode power supply design rather than the EI core transformer, which is much nicer in my opinion. You know it's going to last a lot longer. But we've got the mains coming in at the bottom here through a small mains filter. There is no dedicated filter on this unit, unlike we've seen on many of the other devices. So that might be something to add in the future. But then that goes out to these very large bulk capacitors. And then interestingly... I've gone through my whole life never seeing this chip before, and then it's in two devices in a row. This is the Fairchild 7M0880 switch mode controller chip with all the uh, transistors built in as well. Now, this one is a knockoff device. There's no genuine branding on it, so they've cheapened a little bit there, and they have got sort of no-name capacitors as well. So some cost-cutting has been had. And then, similarly, we've got exactly the same brushless motor driver the MC33035 that we saw in the little Metcal unit. So this PCB, architecturally, is a 
blind carbon copy of the Metcal one. It's just that they've laid it out slightly differently. You can see we've got a big row of the transistors at the back here. But it's using the same component, similar size transformer and everything. I'm quite surprised, uh, you know, how similar it is. Construction of the PCB is pretty nice. We've got some sleeving on the wire round resistors just here to stand them off from the board and also to stop anything sort of brushing up against the legs casually. We've got some Celastic on the capacitors here and also on the Leylon ones at the front here. Some holes in the PCB for the heatsink on the switch mode power supply chip and a very nice looking transformer here. Looks to have been wound really nicely. We've got some copper banding to improve the EMC performance. And yeah, it doesn't look too bad at all really. Really quite a nice bit of construction. Then here we've got the massive pump. It's got the rubber silencer to reduce some of the air noise going into the blower. The blower itself is huge. It is mounted on some anti-vibration feet, which you can see here. Then it's got this little clamp assembly, which is holding the actual motor part of the blower. And then the air just comes out here straight into the front panel and out into the tubing. There is a little bit of protection here just to stop these wires chafing on the metal mount. So that's all quite nicely done. And if you're just able to see down here, you can see that the motor is rated at 24 volts DC. 5 volt DC for the Hall effect sensors for the position. And then we've got a rating of 2.85 amps. So that's what this switch mode power supply is doing. It's providing the 24 volts, very similar to the Metcal, mainly for the brushless motor. So yeah, really quite a powerful piece of kit. So I've got the front panel PCB here, and we've got the connectors which are all nicely glued in so that they just don't accidentally fall out. We've got a little connector up here. There's more pins than you'd think for programming, so I'm not really sure what that one is for. But it's right next to the 18 Mega 16A, so maybe it is for programming and it's got maybe a UART or something on there as well. It looks like there could have been some other options fitted. There's something here that says U4 that's quite a big component. I don't know what that would have been. We've got space for a crystal that hasn't been fitted. Here we've actually got mains on the front panel. You can see this has been uh, tightened up a little bit extreme and it's pushed the plastic out of alignment. But mains is on these two terminals here and these two are the output to the heater. There is an isolation mark, as you can see, just about in white all the way around there and around this heat sink. And then this is what's driving our 1200 watt heater. So we've got a triac here and then that's mounted on this big heat sink and this heat sink is soldered into the PCB to stop it ripping the triac off the board. There is a safety issue with this device. This is the earth lead going down to the handpiece and this is really quite small in cross-sectional area. Certainly not sufficient for the 10 amps that the fuse is rated for and this should be at least the same as the two wires that are going down to the heater. So these are the correct diameter. This one is not. If there was a fault at the heater end, there's no way that this would withstand the fault current. So likely this would blow before the fuse would actually blow, which is a problem. If you've got a earth leakage circuit breaker or similar, you'll probably be okay, but this certainly wouldn't meet the UK regulations. This device isn't actually CE marked, so technically uh, it wouldn't be for sale in the UK anyway but this would be one of the problems that would have been picked up during the inspection. So that's the Quick 861X. I do really quite like the design of this, but it certainly wouldn't be my recommendation. Even the 861DW, I would imagine, is not that much different in terms of performance. It got nowhere near that 500 degree set point. I suspect they're doing what they are doing in the little Metcal unit where the temperature sensor is in the heater and therefore the air temperature that's being blown out the tip of the nozzle is not what it says on the display, which means that these displays are relatively useless. All they are is an indication to make sure that you're setting it the same each time. We also saw some cost cutting measures in place. So no dedicated AC inlet filter, no IEC connector on the back. We had no name parts on the PCB. So that Motorola switch mode power supply chip was just a generic part, either been ripped off or whatever, uh, but not the original part in there. And then we've got the safety issue of that tiny earth wire going down to the handpiece, which is really where you need the earth wire. That's the bit that you're handling. So you actually want the safety on the handpiece and that's where they've scrimped on that bit of wiring. So in conclusion, I really do like the design of this thing, but the value for money just isn't there, especially in the 861X 
the A61DW at $300 I still don't think is anywhere near as good as the best BST863 which is just incredible value for money. It's dropped in price a little bit um, so it's even cheaper now but it has a proper transformer in there and everything else is pretty much uh, absolutely acceptable in there. They've got an AC filter and everything so the best station is looking like really good buy at the moment. If you haven't quite got the budget for that then the quick 857DW but this 861 despite the popularity for me just isn't quite ticking all the boxes. I'm going to take a little look to see if I can work out why this is causing the lights to flicker. I've never seen a triac switching device cause the lights to flicker unless something isn't working properly so I'll have a little look at that. I'll also put the links to this in the description down below if you want to take a little look. Hopefully you enjoyed this series of videos. If you've got any questions or if you want me to have a look at any other devices then let me know in the comments down below. But until next time, thanks for watching.